This is Lesson 12.3, The Art and the Artist. How did art reflect Renaissance ideals? 1.2, explain the political, intellectual, and cultural effects of the Italian Renaissance. And there are a lot of cultural effects of those ideas that we talked about in these last two lessons. In the Italian Renaissance, rulers and popes, that's rulers and popes, you know, uh, secular people and religious people, concerned with enhancing their prestige, commissioned paintings and architectural works based on classical styles, and the developing naturalism in the artistic world, and often the newly invented technique of geometric perspective. And then the Northern Renaissance, and we've talked about the differences between the Northern Renaissance and the Italian Renaissance. Explain how Renaissance ideas were developed and maintained and changed as the Renaissance spread to Northern Europe. And it says the Northern Renaissance retained a more religious focus, we learned about that last time, which resulted in more human-centered naturalism that considered individuals and everyday life appropriate objects of artistic representation. That's actually true of both the Northern Renaissance and the Italian Renaissance. And then we've got topic 1.11, causation in the Renaissance and the Age of Discovery. Explain the causes and consequences of the Renaissance and the Age of Discovery. And it, when it goes into detail, it wants us to know this, the rediscovery of works from ancient Greece and Rome and observation of the natural world changed many Europeans' view of their world. A revival of classical texts led to new methods of scholarship, we know about that, and new values in both society and religion. Those values were expressed in the art, and in fact, it goes on to say, the visual arts incorporated the new ideas of the Renaissance and were used to promote personal, individual, political, and religious goals. We still have Italy right there um, uh, organized in uh, independent city-states. And so we begin with this idea of patronage, patronage patterns. Patronage is about who pays for the art. And patronage patterns were changing after the Black Death. Before the Black Death, the church was the largest patron of art. In other words, the largest customer the largest consumer of art, the biggest payer, was the church. And the church was a good patron. It was a loyal patron, kept a lot of artists working. So it can't be criticized for that. But, and again, this is not a criticism. It's just the way it was. They wanted their art to have certain subjects. They wanted it to be a certain style. And, you know, they're the ones paying and so they should get it their way, but it kind of inhibited individual expression among the artists because they were being paid to do it a certain way. But after the Black Death, you had more lay people, people who are not clergy, who don't work for the church, who were paying for art. Also, you had secular princes, you had rich merchants, and you even had middle class people. And they were different. They were a different kind of customer. They were a different kind of patron. They didn't tend to tell the artist how to paint. Often, they didn't even tell the artist what to paint. They were like, surprise me. And the artist, because of that, was now freer to show and develop his or her own individual style. The Black Plague also created a lot of wealthy people who inherited money from relatives who had died and investment in traditional commercial things like cloth and banking, those had become much more risky. They were no longer as likely to pay off, right, because markets for those things had largely collapsed. And so you have to have all this money. You need to invest it in something. It's useless just sitting there by itself. And why not put your money in things that are beautiful and pleasing? Not to mention art at this time was considered a good, solid financial investment. It was considered a smart place to put your money. It wouldn't make you rich. You weren't going to make a massive killing. But at least it would slowly increase in valuable over time. So art was considered a safe investment. 
There were also changes in religion. As we know, the church had gone through a lot of problems that we talked about in the summer reading, the Great Papal Schism, the Black Death, the Hundred Years' War. And over the course of all of this suffering, the church had lost a lot of credibility. So many people were turning to art for their religious expression and for their religious experience apart from the church. The church just wasn't doing it for them. And then secularism, which we talked about at length in the last lesson, secularism was changing the art. Art no longer had to be about just religious subjects. You could have art about, hey, classical subjects. You're studying all this classical literature, right? And you could even have art about daily life. Humanism, which we talked about last time, was changing the art. We talked about how eloquence and precision of expression was one of the pillars of humanism. And eloquence and precision assured that people were talking about and seeing the same thing, didn't it, through good descriptions and good words. But you know, what about the eye? What about what the eye sees? Hence, linear perspective or geometric perspective, making things uh, closer things look, you know, making things that are closer bigger and making things that are supposed to be farther away smaller. See, in medieval art, it didn't mean things were further away if they were smaller in a picture. It meant that they were less important. And bigger things, they weren't understood to be closer they were understood to be more important. Eloquence and precision of, of expression also called for the correct anatomy, right? You've got to get the anatomy right if you're going to be precise and you're going to be accurate. So artists now had to study things like bone structure and facial structure and, and um, muscular, musculature. And hey, if we're going to talk about the same person, like we're both talking about, you know, Betty, right? Wouldn't it be helpful to know what that person looks like? Hence, portraiture. They did not do portraits in the Middle Ages. Portraiture suddenly in the Renaissance becomes popular. Portraits of people with individual features and uh, human emotional expressions, right? These are high values, individuality, and human expo emotion and human expression. These are hallmarks of the Renaissance. So Renaissance art was really kind of trying to do the very same thing with pictures and with forms that the Renaissance writers were trying to do with their words. Same value. And so let's look at some art. We're going to start with a really early one. This is Giotto. And he did this particular painting that we see here about 1325. So it's a pre-Renaissance painting. But you can see which direction things are starting to go in, even this early. And this painting is called The Death of St. Francis. And Giotto, of course, he preceded the Renaissance by decades, 1325, right? But this whole entire painting is trying to get you to look at the face of St. Francis dying right there in the bottom left of the picture. And St. Francis is depicted right there as a real person with some individual features. In fact, they all are. And the painting is meant to get you involved in the emotion. And notice how it directs your eye downward and to the left by the lines of the guys who are standing up and kneeling down and looking at St. Francis, you almost kind of like, you're like, oh, what are they looking at? And, you know, subconsciously you're looking down to the left. And he's also using placement to give that painting a sense of depth. You know, you've got one monk in front of another one and in front of another one, right, in the upper right. And so that kind of lets you know that you know, things are already headed in this um, direction of more realism, more emotion, more individuality. And then you've got Brunelleschi's church in San Lorenzo doing the very same thing. He's using these architectural lines 
just like Giotto is using the lines of his painting to get you to look at the altar. Brunelleschi's dome on the, on the cathedral in Florence he actually had to relearn how to design a dome. Nobody had designed and built a dome since Roman times for centuries and centuries, and nobody knew how to make one. And so when they were making the, this church, somebody had the bright idea of, hey, let's put a dome on this church. That'll be really cool, but nobody knew how to make one. So Brunelleschi had to go and uh, research Roman ruins to try to figure out how they had done it. This is Masaccio in 1427, so it's still a pretty early one. And this is called The Resurrection of the Son of Theophilus. And you can see what he is doing to try to put some depth and perspective in the painting. Like, for example, the guy in the doorway. And he's using the guy in the doorway to create some depth. You've got Fra Filippo Lippi with his Madonna and Child. And here's what, what you see here. Here's what makes this thing really Renaissance. And by the way, one of the most popular subjects, they made hundreds and hundreds of them. And some artists made practically nothing but these, you know, so many variations, is Mary with the, with the baby Jesus. I mean, they made tons of them. And um, the thing that makes this so Renaissance is that Mary here is depicted as a real person. You, ha you can look at her face and you can, well, first of all, one of the things you can, you, know, you can feel like is, you know, wow, if I saw that person on the street, I would recognize that person on the street because she, you, know, you can see her individual features and you can look into her face and just read her emotions. Didn't have anything like that in medieval art. Didn't come till the, to the Renaissance. The death of Adam, right? Piero della Francesca. Notice the depth in the bottom left, giving us a, some background. Notice the, you know, the angel and this other person talking, and you know, you can see one person in front of the other, and uh, so you see some background going on there. This is Lorenzo, Lorenzo Giberti, and this is not a painting. Um, lots of different media were used in the Renaissance for art. And this is actually a, a, the door to the baptistry in, in the Florence church. He actually won a contest for this door. And this door has 10 panels uh, depicting biblical scenes. And if you look really close, if you were standing next to this door, these um, sculpted scenes would look amazingly real. Donatello who lived from 1386 to 1466, wasn't just a turtle. Uh, he was actually an outstanding early Renaissance sculptor. And he traveled actually with Brunelleschi to Rome. When Brunelleschi went to Rome to study Roman ruins to figure out how to, to design a dome, Donatello actually went with him and, and he studied the Roman sculpture. So when he got back in Florence, he revived classical Roman sculpture and all of its realism and all of its admiration for the human body. And his bronze, David, was the first Renaissance nude and it was considered quite shocking at the time. What's really cool about this particular statue is if you look at the bottom near his feet, there's Goliath's severed head. Leonardo da Vinci, lots of people, you've probably seen this painting a million times. Leonardo da Vinci was one of your Renaissance men. You know, he was a painter, an architect, an engineer, a sculptor. sculptor. And um, only 15 of his paintings survive. And uh, uh, all of them, all of them are among the greatest masterpieces of all time. And we've all seen this Last Supper in Milan Right, and it, so it has Jesus in the Last Supper with his apostles. And his greatest talent, Leonardo da Vinci's greatest talent, was in portraying human psychology and emotion in his subjects and capturing a famous moment in time. And what he does with this Last Supper painting is he's showing the, the various reactions of the disciples at the very moment, the moment, if you're familiar with the story, where Jesus reveals 
that one of them is going to betray him. And they all have individual reactions at this moment. They're all, you know, like, not me, maybe it's you, couldn't be impossible and they all have these individual reactions so this painting is celebrating individuality and human emotion and human drama and then everybody's familiar with michelangelo's david but did you know this and like leonardo da vinci he was also a genius at painting architecture and sculpture he also liked to, to portray his subjects in moments of psychological transition when their faces most clearly reveal the inner self. You don't know that you don't know this, or a lot of people don't know this, but that statue is actually taking place in a particular instant in time. You thought he was just standing there. But what Michelangelo is actually giving us is David's face at that very instant, that very moment that David is looking at Goliath and deciding, yes, I'm going to go for it. I am going to take him on. And that's the expression on his face. Other extremely important artists like Jan van van Eyck. Now, he is a Northern Renaissance guy. And he's from the Netherlands. And one of the things that the Northern Renaissance art is known for is its meticulous detail and its vivid colors. And this is one of his most famous paintings, the Ar Arnolfini Wedding from 1434. And all of these elements in this painting have deep uh, symbolic significance. So it's commonly called, this painting is commonly called the Arnolfini Wedding. It's Van Eyck's most famous work. And the subject is, of course, it's the, the, the pose of this couple that are getting married. And so he chooses, he's not portraying this in a church. It's actually in a bedchamber instead of a church. And so everything you see in this painting has symbolic meaning. For example, the fact that the, that the wife appears to be pregnant, that's symbolic of the holy purpose of their wedding, bringing children into the world. And also the fact that she's wearing green, green represents fertility. And she's kind of pulling her dress up a little bit in the front, and she's signifying that she's willing to bear children in this marriage. Um, there's other symbolic Im imagery too, like for example, the dog, the dog standing there at their feet. The dog is a symbol of loyalty and fidelity to each other. And you see some sandals right there, right? Somebody took their sandals off, right? Why did they take their sandals off? Because this wedding right here is on holy ground. Right, so they're on that. So when those you see those sandals removed, this is holy ground. This union, this wedding. Um, you also have um, the, the the a wall in the back, which shows this is amazing. A a mirror, right? A convex mirror, and you can see the backs of the two people getting married. And um, there's a signature above that, which says. Um, uh, Jan van Eyck was here. And so it kind of suggests that maybe by this painting, he was acting as a witness, a legal witness to the marriage. And so all of these things um, are in this painting. You've got this candelabra on top with one candle lit, and that's supposed to represent Jesus, who is uh, part of this, this covenant that they are engaging in. Jan, uh, Jan van Eyck painted this painting around 1435, Madonna and Chancellor Roland. And it's the Chancellor of the Duchy of Burgundy, Nicholas Roland, and he's being presented with Jesus by Mary. And the weird thing is, you know, Mary, well, she was never in Burgundy, right? But if you look outside the building, that's the that's Roland's hometown of Altun, Altun in uh, in Burgundy, right? And so 
this was very typical. The patrons of the paintings, the people who were buying the paintings and putting up the money for the paintings, were often prominently displayed in the paintings, not because they were vain, you know, and wanted everybody to see them, but because the, the paintings were really primarily for their own use. And so it helped them to imagine themselves as just being close to the biblical story, right? And so if you're praying and you've got your painting there, it's kind of an aid in prayer, kind of helping you feel closer to who you're praying to. And this fluidity of time and space, you know, everybody knows Mary was not in Burgundy, right? But this fluidity, that's kind of something that the medieval mind really had no trouble accepting. Um, they accepted that much more easily than we do today. This is another Jan van Eyck painting, and he painted this around 1437, and it's called the Dresden Tri Triptych, something that was in great demand um, in the Northern Renaissance by churches was, was these things called triptychs, and triptych means three for three pieces. And what they were was they were church altar pieces, and they were painted with oil uh, most of the time on oak panels, and they would have three pieces. You'd have a centerpiece and two wings, and then they'd be connected by hinges so that they could be kind of collapsed. If anybody's ever done a project on a trifold poster, a trifold poster is kind of like a triptych, right? And so the guy kneeling on the left side, you know, on the left wing right there in black, right, he's the guy that put up the money for this painting. And if you look closely, his hands are open, right, to show that his mind is being blown right now because he sees Mary with the baby Jesus right in front of him. Every single detail means something. The meticulous detail and the vivid color of Jan van, Eyck, not Jan van Eyck's enunciation is characteristic of this 15th century Northern Renaissance art. And this painting was painted about 15, about 1434. Um, other extremely important artist, Rogier van der Weyden. He was also from the Netherlands. He was a Northern Renaissance painter, and he was known for his control of emotion and emotional expression. And this, we call this painting, Lady in a Winged Bonnet. And the amazing thing about this is she's looking right at us. Right, she's making eye contact with us. You know, her face is a little off to the side, right? And you just can't resist wondering what she is thinking. I mean, what is going on in her head as she is looking at us? And Rogier van der Weyden also did triptychs like this one. And what's the best way to create unity on a triptych. I mean, you want the, the centerpiece and the two wings to have a sense of unity. You don't want it look, to look like they were just, you know, slapped together. And so, uh, Rogier van der Weyden actually painted the entire thing, the entire triptych on just one panel, knowing ahead of time that somebody was going to take a saw to it and saw it into three parts and make it into a triptych. And so, you, you see the frames on the triptych? Well, he even painted those frames on his own work to guide the saw of whoever was going to cut this thing into three parts. And so this is really neat. The donors of the painting, the people who put up the money for this painting, well, they're the ones that are in the center right there at the cross, uh, or, you know, uh, to the right, kneeling down and praying, right? And they're dressed in kind of brown, dark colors. And so there is the arrow right here points at a little fissure in the earth right there that kind of that serves to get provide just a little bit of separation in time and space that little fissure kind of says well we weren't really there but you know spiritually we're there so Jan van Eyck and Roger van der Weyden uh, they managed to achieve the status of equality with those great Italian painters Right? And so they elevated the Northern Renaissance painting to the very same technical level, the very same level of sophistication and talent uh, and technical expertise as those Italian painters. Here you got this painting right here 
by, um, this was influenced by Jan van Eyck, but it was actually by a painter named Petrus Christus. And it was painted about 1450. And the amazing thing is the symbolism. The left side, if you can see, you got this wall over here and it's overgrown and it's kind of crumbling. It's old, it's old. And it represents the Old Testament. And then on the right side of the, of the painting, right, you've got this church that's quite a bit newer, right? And that represents the New Testament. And you've got Mary and the angel Gabriel, and they're standing in the doorway, the doorway into the New Testament. Albrecht Dürer, he was a German painter, Northern Renaissance also. He was in communication with those Italian artists like Raphael and Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, he was a colleague of theirs. He knew them, they knew him. And he also painted with not just canvas, but with oil and wood. He used lots of media, wood cuts, uh, engravings in metal. And he also had a keen interest in helping other artists achieve things like linear perspective and getting their art developed. Another extremely important artist, Italians, Italian guy, Raphael. Raphael was from Florence, painted on anything, and he actually formed this large production studio with about 50 employees. And it's amazing how quickly he got that done because he died on his 37th birthday. He was the guy that did that portrait of Baldessari Castiglione, the guy who wrote The Courtier. And of course, he did this, um, uh, the School of Athens painting, right? School of Athens right there took him two years to paint that thing. And the red arrow, if you follow the red arrow down to the lower right, and if you got a close-up of that face, that's him. He put himself, his own face, in the School of Athens. Other extremely important artist, Titian, Titian was from Venice, and he loved those mythological subjects. Also did a lot of religious themes, but he was known for his use of color, right? And that was very influential. He lived well into his 80s, and he was a proponent of a style that's closely related to Renaissance art. In fact, it really is a Renaissance art style called Mannerism. Mannerism in the Renaissance. You know, you get all this technical expertise and this technical proficiency and you start, you're making things look so real. After a while, how many super duper realistic paintings can you make before you start to get kind of bored? Right, and so mannerism was Renaissance art taken to the extreme. You might as Renaissance art on crack or something. You might say, or steroids. Instead of perfectly real human anatomy, let's do something different. Let's take things a little further. Let's do some cool things like like wild poses, right? And you can see that in this statue. Is he, you know? He, the, the figure in the statue looks all kind of twisted up and it doesn't look very comfortable. Exaggerated muscles, right? Nobody really has muscles like that unless they're taking steroids. Distorted figures, saturated colors in the paintings, intense drama, intense emotion, and tension, right? Look how weird Mary's neck looks. It's like that does not look natural. Right, uh, the unnatural body positions and the muscles. Right, um, on on uh, Mary's lap, Jesus looks like he's about to fall off her lap. He looks like he's about to slide off, like just about any second, and that just makes you nervous just to look at the painting. So, what was the purpose of mannerism as opposed to you know your your more mainstream renaissance well the purpose was to create a more gut response a more visceral visceral response in the viewer right all of this color and all of this drama and this emotion and this exaggeration and this distortion it has a way of creating a certain amount of imbalance and it makes you work harder to try to figure it all out and make sense of it all i mean on this painting look at the you know, the person at the bottom with the red curly hair trying to hold up Jesus, and that looks really, really uncomfortable. So what was the extent of this, this subgenre called mannerism? Well, a lot of well-known artists whose names you know 
were inspired to try mannerism. And this includes Michelangelo. Like Michelangelo, when he painted The Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel, right? That's mannerism right there. Michelangelo, in a kind of a Taylor Swift mo move, you know, he put the face of an Italian papal official who criticized his work in the painting as one of the damned people right there in the Sistine Chapel for everybody to see. So, mannerism, and we have kind of, we have Robert Wade um, from, at the time, Brian Adams High School. He's not at Brian, Brian Adams anymore, and he has a little presentation here about mannerism, 1520 to about 1600. The changing role of the artist. The Italian Renaissance painter Giorgio Vasari wrote a series of biographies called The Lives of the Artists, 1568. And Vasari is known as the first art historian. And Vasari wrote that the artist was no longer just a member of a crafts guild. He was no longer a craftsman. Rather, the artist had elevated himself and was now an equal in the courts of Europe with scholars and poets and humanists. And therefore, the artist should be recognized and rewarded for his unique artistic technique. And the Italian word for that was maneria. See, now you're getting to mannerism, right? Mannerism emerged in that late Renaissance, pre-Baroque, you know, interim. And art was at an impasse after that perfection and that harmony of the Renaissance. You know, from where, you, where we, from things that we've seen, where do you go from there? Where do you take your art once you've achieved that kind of perfection? So mannerism was kind of antithetical to those natural principles of the high Renaissance. And so mannerism came from the Italian word di maneria, a work of art done in the artist's characteristic touch, his recognizable manner. That's mannerism. So the term mannerism was first used by the German art historian Heinrich Werflin, Werflin in the early 1920s. Mannerism was influenced by Michelangelo's later works like The Last Judgment. So Michelangelo's Last Judgment in the Sixteen Chapel, you know, you can look at this and there's just unbelievable stuff going on. It is the wildest thing. And um, this is the left side, the lower left side of The Last Judgment. And this is the right side of The Last Judgment right here. And just, wow, you, you can, it just, it would take you days and days to, you know, figure it all out, take it all in. Features of man, mannerism. Well, if we're going to make a mannerist painting, let's do this. Let's replace harmony with dissonance and discord. Right, Susanna and the Elders, Alessandro Allori, you know, he puts in twisted bodies and contrapposto poses, right, where they're off balance. Let's replace reason with emotion, the pieta, pieta, the, the taking of Jesus' body down from the cross, very popular subject matter. And this is um, Rosso Fiorentino. This is El Greco's Pieta. Took him 10 years to paint this, right? 1587, 1597. Let's replace reality, right? Because this reality is what we've been working with with the Renaissance. Let's replace that with imagination. The mystic marriage of St. Catherine, right? By Parmagianino. Charity by Andrea del Sarto. Let's create instability instead of equilibrium, like the Rape of Helene, right? Fran Fran Francesco uh, Primaticcio. Um, if you look at the painting, it feels like all the weight is on the left side. There's a lot more happening on the left side than on the right side. The right side, compared to the left side, looks kind of a little bit empty, especially in that upper part. Distorted bodies. Here's El Greco again, right? Christ in agony on the cross. 
in its attempt to express religious tension of the times. The Adoration of the Name of Jesus by El Greco. Here's a detail of it. And there's Philip II of Spain right there, right? The Baptism of Christ, El Greco. And you can see John the Baptist with a shell, pouring the shell down, and there's a dove right there above him. But look at all this other stuff that's going on. Portrait of a Cardinal, El Greco again. And St. Jerome. Remember, St. Jerome was the guy that created the, the Vulgate, right? That early, early Latin translation of the Bible. Let's use lurid colors, and this is The Tempest by Giorgione. Caravaggio, right? The Calling of St. Matthew. And El Greco again, the view from Toledo in Spain. Look at that green. Let's use crowded pictorial space, right? And this was going back to that Madonna with the long neck right there. And look at the crowding of the girls there to the left. I mean, they're all just kind of piled in. On the right side, there's nothing, nothing going on, right? Look at all the crowding in, down the, in the center in Joseph in, in Egypt. Last Supper, Tintoretto. Let's put a void in the center of the thing. Like, in other words, we just have nothing important at all going on in the center. Or maybe even total blackness. This is Titian again. Bacchus and Ariadne. And again, right, right in the center, nothing but blackness and shadow. And this is the weirdest thing of all, hanging figures. Figures that are suspended in the air, and they seem to be held up by nothing. Right, Moses drawing water from the rock. And there's also uh, mannerist architecture, right? You had stylishness in design that could be applied to a building as well as a painting. And it showed extensive knowledge of Roman architectural style. And so the architecture, the sculpture, the walled gardens were seen as a complex but not necessarily unified whole. And this is the Palladian. Over-the-top architecture, right? Putting stuff in there that not necessary at all. You're just doing it so that you can go over the top. The Fountain Blue School taught French mannerism, and that flourished from 1531 to the early 17th century, right? And its characteristics, extensive use of stucco in moldings and picture frames, frescoes, an elaborate, often mysterious system of allegories and mythical iconography, it's centered around the royal chateau of Fontainebleau in France. There it is. Look at how ornate that hallway is. It looks like it's in the Palace of Versailles. And there was lots of sculpture that was done that was manneristic in nature. Um, the nymph, look at all the folds and the wrinkles in her clothes. Same with, uh, with this, the, all the wrinkles, all the folds, just over the top, unnecessary. And so that is the art and the artist. And uh, so I hope this was informative and feel free to look at this again as many times as is necessary.